Welcome to the Less Doing Podcast, where you will learn how to start living more by doing less. Let me help you optimize, automate, and outsource your entire life so you can focus on doing the things you love. Now here's your host, Ari Mizell. So I'm talking to Chris Denson, and we're going to talk about how to crush that box, right? So uh, Chris, thanks for being on the show. Uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So what is Innovation Crush? Uh, um, it's my life's work, Ari. No, it's uh, Innovation Crush is a uh, series I created about uh, four and a half years ago almost five um, interview series that explores innovators of all types. Um, everyone from most recently, we published an episode with the director of venture and innovation at Homeland Security to uh, a nine-year-old kid who raised $1.2 million for his best friend's disease. And really just the, you know, the whole series over the course of all these episodes, um, is really focused on extracting the best practices and principles and the, I guess, the emotional intelligence of, of innovation um, and what it means to reimagine in your industry, in your field, how we live, work, and play. So how did you get started with the, I mean, what, what got you started on the path of uh, identifying innovators? Uh, frustration. <laughs> Always so, the best one. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you know what? I'm kind of pissed off. I'm going to do something about it. Um, I, you know, I left a, a, a pretty decent gig and I kind of had had a glimpse of what innovation could mean as a practice within organizations. And, you know, as I was going around for about a year, uh, talking to different companies and almost selling myself in, in terms of, you know, I'd, I'd done a lot of marketing before and a lot of product development and had some successes, but I kind of saw this evolution of what marketing and reach and engagement is, especially when it comes to there's 10,001 different ways to be inventive in the ways people that, uh, in ways people engage. And, um, and as I was having these conversations, it was, I, it just became clear to me that, you know, there was very little, you know, uh, I guess on a mass scale of understanding what innovation is as a practice and why it's important inside organizations. And so um, I was like, you know what, I know enough stories out there and uh, and people who are doing it that I admire, whether some of them I know and some of them I don't, um, why don't I create a show? And, you know, historically, you know, my the beginning of my career, I'd done stand-up comedy and writing and uh, television production and some things like that. And so, you know, this was an opportunity to combine uh, like my historical interest and, you know, just this examination of the future. And so hopefully over the, you know, over the course of time, just kind of keep dropping seeds and planting seeds around um, the spirit of, hey, there's so many different ways to reimagine and, and uh, reinvent. So what is what are some of the innovations for you that, that are most exciting, right? Like, because we can innovate in so many different fields. But what, what do you what, what's most exciting to you personally right now that you're seeing in terms of innovation? Um, you know, it's hard to, to point out one thing per se, you know, I guess the first thing that comes to mind, um, is kind of around biometric technology, you know, things that measure our heart rates and our physiology and, you know, um, our steps, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and a little bit beyond wearable tech, but this idea that, you know, in, in the world that I play in most is inside the brands and startup space. Every brand makes a, an emotional promise, right? Whether it's Snickers really satisfies or, you know, um, Wells Fargo done, maybe not the best example, but, uh, <laughs> um, but this idea that there's some sort of emotional promise and the ability to sort of quantify what that is um, and use those as new data points on how we actually serve customers and people and each other better. And, you know, it's not just a, a survey or pushing, you know, buttons on a, on a tablet. And not only that, you've got sort of camera technology that, that can detect sentiment. And, you know, and I think for me, technology and or innovation um, is, is, is best when it serves people better. And, you know, the fact that we can measure that in a, in a new and interesting way is pretty exciting. 
Absolutely. And and where do you see people getting tripped up a lot of times where it's they don't allow innovation into their their companies or their what they do? Uh, you know, I think you you get um, stuck in success, I guess, you know, in, in many cases it's um, it's you know, we're doing fine. We don't need to do X, Y and Z. Oh, that's not we don't need to do that now. Well, oh, we can't formulate a team around like whatever sort of story you tell yourself as an organization about why it's not important now um, is um, is the mistake. You know, one of the most common mistakes. And, you know, I think it, one of the best examples that we all sort of know is the whole blockbuster versus Netflix story. Right. Where Reed Hastings is like, you know what? I'm tired of these. You know, he was also frustrated. Right. I'm tired of these late fees. Um, I've invented this thing. Hey, Blockbuster, do you want to buy it? And they're like, no, no, thanks. And I think the last, there's like one more Blockbuster open somewhere in Alaska. Like, <laughs> um, so it's this failure to just kind of play and experiment and try to invent and, and imagine what your future looks like, even if it doesn't go anywhere. I think just being in the habit of doing so, um, kind of it moves the needle enough. And do you, so one of the things that I often talk about is I think that constraints lead to better innovations than uh, like unlimited resources. Just in my experience, I think that you can create a lot more innovation when you have a lot less to work with. And you're welcome to disagree with me, but what do you think of that? No, I absolutely agree. It's funny that you say that a couple of years ago, um, a friend of mine wrote a Forbes article that uh, I, I chatted with him about, and that was the exact thesis that we came up with was that some of the best innovation does come from constraint. It's that when you don't have enough time, you don't have enough resources, but you need to make an impact, you know, in some way, shape or form, whether you need to invent something or, you, or you're trying to hit a marketing moment or whatever it is. And, you know, it forces you to be, to have some ingenuity. You give it's uh, Kevin Smith said, I make really good $200,000 movies and I make really shitty $20 million movies. <laughs> it, and um, and I think that's true in a lot of cases of people who are really inventive or organizations that are really inventive. It's like, all right, we don't have a lot to work with. Um, I, I grew up in the city of Detroit. And if you look at the journey of what Detroit has, you know, kind of sunken and risen again, um, a lot of that is like, all right, you're at rock bottom. You have no choice but to think of something new and different that you haven't done before. <laughs> so you kind of remove the comfort and get over the angst and suddenly you're in some like beautiful oasis of, of uh, ingenuity. Can you give me examples of where you've seen that? Ha- I mean, uh, where you've seen that happen other than, and then in Detroit, which is a good one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it happens a lot. Like, uh, you know, for a, a stint of time, I ran the innovation practice for OMD. So Omnicom media group is the, the largest media agency in the world. And there were 20 of us focused on this idea of innovation. So working with clients like Disney to Pepsi to State Farm to Stand Up to Cancer. And I I speak from experience when I say that the buckets of money that get pushed toward innovation are very small. (laughs) Um, You know, when you have a client that's spending anywhere, you know, somewhere in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year in media. And then it's like, hey, here's $20,000. Let's figure something out. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a specific example, but it was just on a on a day by day basis. Uh, you know, one example I talk about in my book is with um, the CW. There was a zombie series that came out called I Zombie. And um, we were thinking like, all right, well, we don't have a lot of money to spend here. The show is coming out pretty soon. What what can we do? And uh, we had a moment to to capture something at South by Southwest. And so what we did was we partnered with a company called Emotive. And Emotive is sort of a almost like a, what do you call it? Um, a connected sweatband, right? So you put it on your head and it kind of measures your brain activity. And they actually have this really amazing visualization of brains. And so we were able to do that and work with them as a startup. And it didn't cost us a lot of money because some of the ingenuity just came in the process of the innovation, which meant that we said, hey, guys, you know, we want to enter this as a partnership. Um, This will give you guys some publicity and lift. And, you know, and for CW, it's a really interesting way of promoting a zombie series. 
And so we allowed people to get their brain scans and uh, also brought in like a 3D printing company and did 3D printed models of people's brains as, in forms of candy. And so people got to eat their own brains. That project didn't cost us a lot of money. You know, um, we were able to do it in, in a very short amount of time. And, you know, we did something that kind of we, we felt like set a new precedent. And going back to that thing I gave you earlier, as far as like, you know, this is actually a test on how we can measure, you know, uh, sentiment around experiences. That's really cool. I love that. Um, so what about in your own business? What's the biggest challenge for you right now? Um, filtering. <laughs> so I think, you know, it, innovation as a, it, as a practice, right? So the, on one side, I have the show, and then the other side, I have the practice, right? So um, working with a lot of brands and organizations and you know, there's always the need. And I'm the, I'm the kind of guy who gets excited by a lot of things, you know, like r romanticized by good ideas and, and cool people doing cool things. Um, and so, you know, I, I think for any company, it's looking at where you actually want to go and really sticking to your guns on the vision, but also giving yourself a little bit of wiggle room to be opportunistic. And a lot of the times those things don't necessarily mesh well together. So, you know, they're trying to be as calculated as possible, but also still trying to explore the magic of serendipity, you know, in the process. And that's always a, a delicate balance. Right. And so not, you know, there's no like really great specific answer for that, I'm sure. But how, how do you how do you do that? Like, like wh what can you do to not just sort of wing it right and put that make it to that balance where it makes sense? I th you know, a mission, mission statements and vision statements help, um, I think, and beyond the statement is the actual visualization of whatever that mission or vision is. Um, and knowing, really being able to care carefully assess any opportunity to see if it matches up with that larger vision. Is it going to move the needle toward that larger vision? You know, um, you know, I think in my case, it's Innovation belongs everywhere. So on one hand, I'm doing my show live at our Basel in December. On another hand, I had a chat with Homeland Security, you know, recently about doing something on the government side. And then there's an educational facility that's just launching um, at a university in the Midwest. And they, so it's just kind of like I have to constantly say, is this matching up with the, the vision that I currently have for Crush Industries? And so um and you know in the in the spirit of less doing i think that also i want to i want my days to be light or at least to feel light <laughs> even though they they may be very busy but the the weight of the things that i experience on a day-to-day -day basis and the types of decisions i have to make with my team um you know kind of always like does this ladder up is this going to move the needle towards the vision that we have as an organization and um, and sometimes that means letting some really cool or sexy looking things go away. Um, you know, shout out to Estonia. I got invited there and was going to be flown out and meet with the government to do all these things. I'm like, ah, it sounds awesome. <laughs> and I was like, but it, but, it, uh, you know, it's it was more in the way than it was a, um, a an asset to the future vision. Yeah, I, I just got an opportunity to speak in Singapore. I live in New York. And so that, that I have to say no to that, unfortunately. But I'm sure it'd be really cool. I and mean, you know, <laughs> have so much trouble saying no to things. And yeah. what is your what is so what does your team look like for your business? Uh small at this point. So, you know, I have a, a manager that I work with. So, you know, my my days post OMD are really like fifty percent talent storyteller, you know, uh, I guess uh, voice in this space quite literally, because I have a podcast like you. Um, and uh, the other 50% is that practitioner. So, you know, we're constantly seeking and assessing opportunities or filtering through different things. Um, and then I have an associate producer that I work with who is kind of like my, my anchor in terms of um, just the, the follow through on things. We did this experience with, you know, a brand at South by this past March. And uh, it was four days, 20 meetings. And, you know, I was only on the phone calls in the beginning, um, also because I wrote a book. And so I launched my book at South By, uh, which was very busy, but also we had this project going. Um, and then just 
partnerships with a couple of or different organizations um, on the production side. So anytime we're, we're creating video, uh, we're actually in the, on the brink of doing some things with WeWorks right now. And, um, and so that is, that'll grow. We'll, we expand and contract depending on what the, you know, what the current state of affairs is. That's great. And that's good to be able to do that, obviously. Yeah. So what are your top three pieces of advice for people to be more effective? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, top three pieces of advice. Um, I th a, I, I think, my, uh, yeah, this is, I don't know if this is too uh, woo woo for your show, but really like make sure you're, you know, you're emotionally sound, right? This emotional intelligence piece and how you show up to people, how you connect with, with individuals. I think, you know, um, I spoke at an event recently and we got on this topic of networking versus relationship building, right? And, you know, on one hand, you're coming, networking has this air of, I, I need to do a chess move with these people that I'm meeting right now, right? And figure out a way to leverage their expertise or their resources, which of course, like we all want to collaborate and, and do cool things with cool people. But in a relationship setting, it's more like, I just want to get to know you, right? And, and, I, and I find that I have more successes when I truly and genuinely vibe with a person, you know, at an entity. So then that's, that's one. Um, Two is uh, the sense of curiosity. You know, um, I think curiosity is just one of those things where it's kind of overlooked as a business trait. <laughs> um, and really just, I, I think that when you are curious and you are asking right questions or just nosing around in areas that don't necessarily marry your industry so if you like if i want to go to an education conference right like it's not so much a thing that's tightly in my wheelhouse but the curiosity may lead me to something that i become really excited about um or the potential of collaboration or finding that unturned stone that you go like oh wow i didn't know this was here this is a great opportunity and i think that just keeps the momentum going right it gives you like i refer to this idea of goosebump moments right there's always a ton of good ideas and opportunities on the horizon, but those things that give you goosebumps that kind of like, oh my gosh, I like that. Now I'm physiologically excited um, are, you know, that's an important piece. Um, and then I think just, you know, finding a, a system that works for you uh, on a more practical side, you know, uh, every, I don't know, a couple times a month, I get an email about a new product or service or tool or thing that I could use to make my business more efficient, right? Um, but I, I also have to know what works. And I also have to know like what works with my personality, with my team structure, with the way we operate, and all that glitters isn't always gold. And, you know, um, it's just uh, making sure that you can stick to your guns in the ways of operating that works best for you. Um, so, you know, those are those are three that come to mind. Those are those are pretty excellent, uh, Chris. So thank you for sharing those yeah. insights. <laughs> and uh, where can people find out more about you and, and your podcast and the work that you do? Uh, at Densonology, D-E-N-S-O-N-O-L-O-G-Y, the study of myself, I suppose. <laughs> um, there's at innovation crush, um, which is, you know, on, oh, this is all Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and I also wrote a book called crush in the box, 10 essential rules for breaking essential rules, which is an Amazon number one bestseller. So, um, I know it's a lot of words, but if you Google Chris Denson's book, I'm sure it'll pop up somewhere. And, um, yeah, those are, those, and my address is one, no, <laughs> um, that's, uh, yeah, I'm, those are, those are primary places and also www.thecrush.co and uh best website name ever thank you so much chris for your time thank you Art. thanks for listening to the less doing podcast at less doing we help entrepreneurs who have opportunity in excess of what their infrastructure can support to set up systems and processes that empower a team to ultimately make themselves more replaceable that way they can optimize automate and outsource everything in their businesses in order to be more effective.
If you want to find out more about Less Doing, the podcast, the blog, the books, and all of the wonderful programs we offer to help you get from where you are to where you know you want to be, go to lessdoing.com slash podcast and check out our OAO blueprint so you can get started today.